everyone, and welcome back. Thanks, Bobby, for hosting the previous session. That was awesome. I am Brett Norton with Beyond Clean once again, and I wanted to take a quick moment to thank our event sponsor, Asculap, and also our uh, collaborator first case for the nursing credits. So thank you both on that end. Our speaker for this next session is Christian Abel. Christian is a manager of technical training and support for SAM operations at Asculap. He has over 18 years of perioperative experience in various roles, including CSD manager or instrument coordinator and ER paramedic. Christian has an extensive knowledge in SPD and supply logistics and process flow, including the use of tracking system. His presentation title is Got Good Water, Why All the Stains? Looking forward to this one. Just side note, uh, what causes our surgical instruments to rust, stain, and corrode? Once it starts, is there any going back? Christian will take a deep dive into the impact your department's water quality can have on your surgical instrument inventory. The session will provide important insights to help you be prepared for whatever comes your way. So let's go ahead and welcome Christian. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to this. Um, I'm guessing everybody just got back from lunch, probably a little warm and comfortable in your chair. And uh, hopefully I can bore you to sleep with um, such an awesome subject like water, water quality and corrosion. So um, just to reiterate, uh, my background has basically always been peri-op um, and certainly SPD. Um, I have been with Ascalab doing consulting for about 10 years too. So this, I've been around a little while. Many of you probably know me. Um, so let's get started here. Um, what is the concept of what we want to talk about today? And understanding that, hey, we always have good water. We have high quality water. Why do we still have staining and corrosion? And this is um, a demon that I spend most of my days during the week chasing around in the United States. And there's a lot of influences, a lot of factors, there's a lot of process um, concerns that you have to look at. And it seems to elude people to think just because I have good water, um, I shouldn't have any kind of surface conditions present on my instruments. But unfortunately, that is the wrong concept. And understanding that is kind of the goal of what we want to achieve today. So let's look at some of the key objectives. Um, identify the common visual um, standing conditions, and I know everybody's probably looked at all their books and seen pictures and did educational training, but do you really know? Do you understand what you're looking at? What do those different, you know, presentations of staining and, and or corrosion um, mean? Where are they coming from? How do you understand? How do you dig a little bit deeper to understand, hey, I have good water, but I still have all these little spots on my instruments. What's going on here? Um, and then understand, you know, the basic functions of, of what water quality does um, and the role of good, you know, good quality water. Um, we'll look at a little bit of the water systems so you can kind of have a visual understanding of some of the things I'll talk about. Um, and then understanding the influences, you know, that are process related. Just because you have good water, what other factors and influences? And I'll walk you through a model that... Um, I like to use when I give these lectures and I do presentations at hospitals around the U.S. to really kind of pull the concept of, uh, you know, the influence factors and understanding beyond just having good quality water. So we'll go ahead and get into it and we'll start with, you know, looking at, there's a delay, I'll try that. All right, sorry. Um, so from my SPD perspective, you know, I think I'm going to take you to like a 40,000 foot view here and understanding things. Like when I walk into a facility and they say, hey, our instruments have these little red dots and we have brown stains all over everything. Um, you know, again, digging into the water and understanding what's happening there at a very basic foundation. Yes, it's important. It's a central hub. But I like to take this perspective and I apply it in my thought process when I'm evaluating at a customer site to understand, okay, what's happening in the OR? You know, you go through every one of these, you know, um, little black triangles on the screen, interoperative, end of use, disposal, cleaning, disinfection, staging, you know, every, every part and every component, every one of those blocks is part of that metrological process. And what does that mean? It's a study of measurement. What's happening at each area? What are the influences? 
Um, and then with each one of those triangles, I like to look at the list on the left. Okay, what are the regulatory cha challenges, transport policies, and procedures? Everything that's there, you know, is there conflict management? What's a, the cause and effect of this? Um, how's it tracked? Every one of those, you know, common denominators have to be looked at at every one of your stages so that you can have a really good understanding of where things may have influences one or the other. Because even though I can go to two different facilities and they each are using the same equipment and the same process and you know the so-called same standards, um, there are a lot of things that are always different variables. And if you think if you change one factor in that equation, it then becomes a different science experiment and your outcome may be different. So it's a very important concept to understand kind of at a high level that there's a lot of other influences out there and a lot of things that you do need to take in consideration and that don't just jump to the water tank and say the water's good. Um, but you'll probably get the point of that by the end of this presentation. So moving on. Um, so let's look at what some of the basic staining conditions are and I'm sure three quarters of the people watching this right now probably <laughs> Yeah, you take that picture in my facility. Um, you know, everyone, is a, this is a rampant thing that we see in the U.S., and I'll get into kind of U.S. processing here in, the, in a few minutes. But for the moment, um, you know, you might have white, chalky, kind of salt-looking stains on your instruments. You know, what is that? Is, it, is that um, something solvable, fixable? Is it a water problem? Is it a process problem? Um, don't really know. Um, but I do get a lot of phone calls on a daily basis, or I get a text that sends a picture like this and say, what's wrong with this? It's stained. <laughs> um, why is stained? I don't know. It takes a lot of digging to really figure that out. Um, so clearly there's a problem, but um, what originally caused it and where it was influenced in the process is what, you know, kind of what I do, is trying to figure that out. Um, so in terms of like, some anomalies of things. I, you know, this year had a presentation of someone who bought all the instruments and they start, hopefully you can see the kind of discoloration on here, but the instruments were turning blue. And I thought it was pretty cool. Didn't really see it was a problem because I like blue instruments, but um, customer wasn't really happy about that, um, especially since they were brand new. So I don't know why your instrument's blue. Good, good thing to understand and look at is again, many influences there, and we'll dig into that um, as we go on the presentation here. Um, typical surface corrosions that I'm sure everybody sees, the one in the middle there clearly is um, a very active corrosive process, probably going to lead to pitting. But the instruments on the uh, outsides there of the slide, you can see, you know, I, I bet half you probably see that stuff on a daily basis. And, you know, some of it is bad, some of it could be bad, some of it we don't know is bad. Um, but in the end, the perception in the operating room is the instruments are dirty. Um, and the bottom line is that if you have stains and corrosion like that, you are getting impurities in your system somewhere along the line. And if you don't know what they are, it's an issue. Um, a lot of industrialized nations outside the United States, um, a facility presenting with instruments in this condition would be shut down. Um, you know, for the most part, we haven't got to that level yet here in the U.S., um, but things definitely have been increasing um, in certain regions of the U.S., particularly California. Shh, didn't say that. Um, but, uh, you know, just understanding that, hey, you have a problem in your process. And, you know, if your white tray liners are turning brown, you have some issues. And that needs to be taking the white tray liner, white tray liner away does not fix your problem because the problem is still there. You just may not see it as easily. And I see that as a common occurrence. Um, a lot of people send the white tray liners out to get tested, and lo and behold, it's water elements. Um, so we'll talk about that when we get to the loggers here in the presentation, understand what the carryover is and how that affects um, the instruments and why they may look like this. Um, some other typical corrosions here, you know, maybe an old tape line that potentially could be a pit. Um, don't really even know. It could be bio burden. Um, on the right, obviously, you have a surface condition where um, you're, it's leaving stains and marks, that type of thing. Uh, keep in mind, as you, you refurbish instruments too, uh, the wheel marks or sandblasting, it doesn't matter what you do, you have a tendency to uh, create what's called surface, you know, increased surface area. 
but you cut little grooves in it. If you think about the valleys and the mountains, you have all these little grooves and cuts. Now you have all kind of little reservoirs for even more staining to occur. So without dealing with your root cause problem, and then you refurbish, you're more likely to have more, you know, corrosion as you move forward. So keep in mind, before you go jumping into revamping a, an inventory, you should be looking at you know the bottom line. How do we prevent this from happening again? So if we spend good hard-earned money on fixing it, that um, we're getting our best bang for the buck and we can worry about sharpening and not instrument surface preservation. Uh, pitting, I'm sure everyone kind of knows. I tried to take some pitting pictures that I had that were, you know, not the real obvious moonscape ones. I, I think maybe the next slide has, you know, some more advanced pitting. But a lot of this stuff, you know, can be seen very easily if you're using magnification, which most CSs have and don't use. Uh, I use an optimizer, and when you look at an instrument surface through an optimizer, it's just, you know, a $20 little Amazon plastic thing that goes on your head, little loops. I walk around with it. Anyone who's met me in a hospital anyway, probably has seen me walk around with it on my head. This, these type of things are extremely obvious to be seen um, with magnification. And I can't stress enough, one of the um, uh, in-service trainings that I created a few years ago um, had a, a 40 instruments that I had everyone go through. There was only one instrument that was in good condition. Everything else had a surface condition. Most people grotesquely fail it, and then I make them retest it with an optimizer on, and all of a sudden everyone's like, wow, didn't realize how much more I could see. So like the, for example, the instrument on the right, um, you know, the typical little halo with a little dot in the middle, well, that's definitely a pit. The one on the left is kind of a blow up of it, so you can really see what it looks like. Um, and then additionally, on this instrument on the right, I wanted to point out, it's very, very hard to see, and maybe some of you have seen it, I'm looking very closely, um, you have what's called organic staining, where blood was left on that instrument for an extended period of time, um, and it etched the surface, and that you can't get rid of it, you can't wash it off, can't rub it off, can't put it in anything, it really has to be buffed all the way through, and hopefully you don't. Um, cause more corrosion after removing the passivation layer. But that's another one. Um, a lot of people see that on the end of instruments, it's, you know, especially like right angles for some reason. I guess they get left sitting with dried blood and then they, uh, you get that organic stain on there. So that's not a water condition or anything else, but something due to, uh, the, you know, process and OR not being wiped off. And um, this is a little bit more of kind of the moonscape pitting that I'm sure you all are familiar with. I don't want to belabor on that too much, but if you don't know how deep it goes or if it's in a hinge point or a pin, that's where we see devices fail, especially interoperatively when they're put under pressure and tension. So pitting is a, you can't really ensure the cleanliness of it. No, there's not really studies that necessarily say someone's going to die, but um, certainly you have a, a risk for Failure, and I'll tell you what. As a manager, director um, in Richmond, Virginia, won't state the name of the place, but um, I had an instrument. It was a cross clamp of all things. A repair company welded it together, thought it would be good, um, put the patient on bypass, and that thing popped off, and the patient almost died, um, severely injured by the blood loss, and it created a lot of panic and. Um, you know what, when you have stuff like pitting like that, I take it very seriously and uh, I hope you all do the same. That, that stuff just needs to be removed. It's out of life. I mean, there, there's some flexibility in understanding a couple little shallow pits that you may have seen in the previous pictures. Could you repair it? Yeah, you might spend good money fixing it and then it's gonna do it again right after it gets processed. So that's a judgment call, you know, from the manager as to whether or not, you know, at what point do you uh, designate that instrument unsafe? But, you know, for generally speaking, pitting is a bad thing, it needs to be taken seriously, and the, this stuff shouldn't be in service. So let's take, um, take a look here at some of the staining conditions uh, for on containers and equipment, because you know what, uh, CS isn't all about instruments, but there's a lot of other factors and things that contribute to corrosions and other things that corrode. Um, so I'm gonna take a break at this point here and I really wanna focus on this model. Um, this is kind of the, uh, the holy grail for me that I go off of and understanding and probably the biggest takeaway from this presentation I want everyone to understand is this chart. It's simple, it's easy, 
and it can tell a lot if you just remember to think about it in this perspective. So the influencers for corrosion, everyone focuses on the water and yes, good quality water is the central hub of this diagram and it is the central hub of understanding what you can and cannot do. However, <clears throat> that being said, you do have to understand, remember we went back to that, if you go back to that first graph I showed you with um, you know, all the different cycles and places and processes and ways of thinking um, of the influences uh, from the beginning of this presentation, same concept, but this is kind of drilled down a little bit more. Water is your central hub. You've got to have good quality water, but how you use it is the most vital way of understanding whether you're going to have corrosion or not. Um, the mechanical action, meaning, you know, is it manual? Is it uh, based on impingement? Are we talking about a system that has low impingement and high chemical uh, detergent? And then what temperature are those detergents running at? All those things that like you can have a perfect process. If you have the wrong temperature and the wrong detergent, you'll have staining or you'll have corrosion. Um, if you're failing in your mechanical action, let's say in a, in a washer, um, you don't have a cold water rinse and you put instrument loads in there that have a lot of surfactants from the, you know, the pre-spray that's used in the operating room. Well, all those things have influences on how the machine is designed. And therefore, if you have a lot of pre-spray and it doesn't get rinsed off thoroughly, it will foam up in the pump and the pump will not be able to pump at the impingement pressure that's necessary. Therefore, you will have failed loads or failed toses or that type of thing. And, you know, I've seen it a hundred times. People dial up the detergent. Well, we need more chemical. And then we change the temperature. You keep changing equations and all of a sudden your instrument inventory looks horrible. Um, all the meanwhile, it just turns out that, you know what, you didn't have a good thorough rinse of stuff going into the washer. So that's what I'm saying. Processes, are so important and vital to understanding, you know, how you use your water and how you end up having influencers that will cause corrosion or staining. It's well beyond just understanding your water quality. And then when we get into water quality, that pH and all the other factors, phosphorus, iron, all that stuff that remains in there at different temperatures and different cycle processes and different rinse water qualities, all are factors. And that includes, you know, starting in the operating room till it gets staged in storage. <clears throat> um, obviously, time is a factor, too, for how long you have ex exposure to each one of these processes. So hopefully you have a little bit better of understanding when we talk about water. It's not just the water, but how it's used and all the influences around it throughout a process, not just one process. So hopefully I've beat that one to death and everyone wants to look at it one more time. All right, so washer analysis notes, you know, kind of on a very low level here, the easy breezy type things that we look at every day, you know, are you expecting everything for debris and stains? As all those things are telltale signs. If you have a lot of debris, then things aren't getting properly processed, um, you know, and on the decon side and it gets debris stuck in the spray arms, spray arms don't work, you lose your efficacy, um, things aren't rinsed and you have detergents and other things that potentially get left on the instruments and you sterilize it and you have all these horrible problems and everyone goes, oh, I don't know what's wrong. Water's good. Um, so ensuring that everything's working the way it's supposed to each and every load is very vital. You know, I know we test once a day for the most part, but um, I think every shift everyone should be inspecting to make sure everything's free and clear, uh, making sure things are open. And we'll talk about kind of the um, processing issues that you run into with people putting fully loaded trays with lids on it and, you know, a pile of instruments that are just in a heaping pile that you can't get cleaned properly. Um, detergent dosing is also very important. This is a very big misstep in a lot of uh, SPDs that just because it's, you know, for example, you have your enzyme or detergent dialed up to a tenth of an ounce per gallon of water, um, that's great that the machine tells you that, but if you're not calibrating it per the manufacturer's IFU and or whatever your PM sequence is, um, you don't actually know that you're getting a tenth of an ounce. So that's the big difference is that, okay, it's telling you you're doing the right thing, but is it really doing the right thing? So big, big understand, misunderstanding a lot of times. And calibration, <coughs> excuse me, simply put, <clears throat> is done by... Uh, you know, the manufacturer for the most part, where they turn the pump on manually, they put a beaker inside and they measure that it actually gave you a tenth of an ounce. Um, so understand calibration is a very vital, you know, role with your, um, you know, washer inspections. Um, verify an efficacy, review your history, 
understanding your, you know, loading and unloading. I think I have some pictures in here of what your carts look like. Those are all telltale signs. Um, you know, inspecting instruments when they come out. I don't know if you, I'm sure some of you probably have had uh, employees walk up and say, hey, the uh, instruments smell funny today. <laughs> um, you know, that's a problem. You have an issue and you're probably going to have staining corrosion as a result of it and or maybe even a patient safety issue. So take that all seriously. You shouldn't have stinky instruments. Um, you know, do they fe feel clean, gritty, slippery? You know, you can tell an instrument when it's properly cleaned. It has a very distinctive feel to it. Um, and make sure, you know, listen to the voice of your technicians. If they say something's not right, something's probably not right. Um, you know, touching these things and look at them every day. They're, they're the... Uh, you know, your frontline defense for patient safety. And that's a very vital role. So let's look at a couple other things. You know, this is kind of a typical day in my life where, you know, customer calls and, hey, we did all these water tests and everyone says the water looks good. Um, and, you know, they send me the lab work and I look at it and go, yep, yeah, water looks good. You know, so what's going on here? What do we have? You know, I, I've seen everything well i haven't seen everything because someone's going to invent some new way to do something here soon but for the most part i feel like i've seen a lot of cool crazy stuff um this one customers all their containers all of them green brown i mean it was awful um and looking at this it took a it took a little while to figure this one out and took some t uh, testing in the lab to really understand the effects of um what they were doing and how it reacted with you know, anodized aluminum in this situation. Um, but, you know, just to kind of give you a quick down and dirty, they had uh, reversed some water lines and were using really nasty water. Um, and they were also had a uh, copper, a silver copper boiler system that was utilized and it was carrying over from the steam and that just the impurities in that process just apparently really, really loved um, anodized aluminum. Um, so once we identified what those were through the lab and testing and chemical reaction type tests, uh, we were able to essentially find an antidote for it. But, you know, it, it, brown stains typically, you know, I see are because somebody sprays an acid of some sort. And the most common one that I see people uh, create brown and they're usually sticky to um, is uh, surface disinfectants, TB spray. Um, that you see in the OR where it's meant and designed for wiping down back tables. Um, so if you spray that inside a container and it doesn't, you know, it, it goes through the autoclave, it dries and it turns brown and it gets sticky and stinky and um, very common occurrence, believe it or not, because people in the OR think they're helping you out by wiping it out with a surface disinfectant. It's good for stainless steel, it must be good for the containers too. Um, at least that's their theory. But anyway, it's just uh, really interesting to see some of this kind of stuff out here where entire inventories have been affected by um, process issues. Um, again, here's another situation where, you know, with equipment, the entire, the customer, everything was, uh, every stainless steel sur surface what, inside, the, inside the washers, inside the chamber walls, inside the transfer carts, everything turned orange. And, and it doesn't really look orange maybe on your screen, but trust me, it was orange. It was a very interesting kind of process to have to go and look at and see how it was affecting the instruments. But their big concern was the, the equipment was all turning orange. Um, so yeah, water looked good. Everyone was testing right, but you know, the processes of how they switched out the detergent systems was unsupervised. The manager really wasn't too involved, didn't understand what was happening. People just did what they did and then the, um, Water guy exchanged the tanks, but hooked them back up wrong and the resin beds reversed and they just ended up having an absolute disaster of a mess. Um, but again, this is the thing, it's a process related issue. It has nothing to do with whether you have good water quality or not. <clears throat> um, lastly, as I was telling you here earlier, um, you know, your, your exit carts specifically um, to have a telltale sign. If your cart on your exit side looks like this kind of staining and that's dripping off your instruments, you have an issue, you have a problem, doesn't take any kind of mad scientist to walk in and go, hey, yeah, your water's got a lot of impurities in it or your process and your washer's obviously failing. Good that your toasty test passed, but <clears throat> clearly you still have a lot of contamination in here. 
Um, so again, testing your water is going to have no bearing on, you know, why you may still have staining or corrosion. Um, let me see. So this, is some of these notes here in terms of like, you know, wrong pipes, things put on bypass, um, excessive carryover. We're gonna get into all that in a minute here. And we talked about the detergent issue, obviously making sure everything's calibrated right before you make adjustments to your dosage. Um, autoclaves, I have probably a few of you have uh, the old older nickel clad uh, chambers that look like that and not a whole lot you can do with them once they get into a really bad condition. But some who have, you know, washers, if you look on the right, I mean, all these things are telltale signs. You know, it's not about the water, but look at your process. Other things are happening in it. Um, purified water in some, some instances at certain temperatures, even if you test for silicate, um, that picture on the right probably is a heat-related silicate um, condition. And it's a matter of identifying is SiO2 or SiO3. Some of it can't, you can't even test in a lab to get an exact number because it's not bonded with something. So there, there's further details that have to be looked at in when you look at lab work. I mean, it's great if you see that it's within a, a low level limit, but what is the low level limit if you're having this kind of condition present? So a really good way to understand <clears throat> water quality is just looking at your equipment. And if you see issues with it, obviously you have bigger problems. So let's start looking at some of kind of the um, nitty gritty here with understanding water systems and water quality in and of itself. So this is a hospital I went to, Abel University. I probably should have had it perfect, but I didn't because it's on my name. But anyway, um, this is some of the like basic water functions that I look at and understand. You know, hardness when it's used, tap water, I'm gonna get on my soapbox here for a minute and preach my, have my little, you know, 30 seconds. For an industrialized nation, and the only industrialization that I know of, tap water is still used. It fluctuates, it changes between seasons, droughts, floods, water sources, whether your city goes from a river to a lake to a well, all those things, all those changes every time, and then you add seasons and outside events, that water, you can test it every day and it's gonna be, it's gonna vary. In different regions of the country, whether you're in a desert or you're a high altitude or you're in the Northeast or in the deep South or Kentucky, one of my favorite places with lots of limestone, um, you, you're gonna have that fluctuation. And if you can't compensate for it in your process, you're gonna have issues. And I just ran into this just last week with, with a customer saying, telling them like, hey, I've been benchmarking this these tests for you for a year. Look at look at what's changed since the you know the last quarter that I was here. When you change the water source, <clears throat> municipal area change the water source, and now you're having all these influences again. So you have to compensate for it and understand how to do that. Um, purified water for the most part, you know, looked pretty decent. And your final rinse water. This is the big major delta. I just I can't stress enough to everybody. You can have perfectly pure pharmaceutical grade water, but if you're not measuring it coming out of the washer and what it's retained, you'll never achieve what you're after. So looking at this, and this is where I'm gonna kind of give everyone the idea and understanding concept of what's called carryover. You have this purified water and the connectivity number is 19. That's a sum number of positive and negative ions. It doesn't necessarily mean it's bad if it's high, um, but usually it does. Um, so you're starting with tap water at 338. Hopefully everyone can see that conductivity is third up from the bottom, going across that line. <clears throat> tap water starts at 338. That's how much contamination, so to speak, of positive and negative charged ions are in that water and available to react with plastics, metals, aluminum, whatever your material is that you're, you're evaluating. You're producing water with 19 microsiemens. So that's okay it's not great i prefer to see a zero one or less than five anyway to start with and then on your final rinse it jumped up to 65. so okay well if we're putting this purified water in here why does the conductivity jump up so high and what's in that 65 micro sequence so that's a lot of the kind of the getting down into the belly of the beast here um really understanding your final rinse quality is really what you want to measure not your purified source although 
you know, if you find really ugly purified water, well, there's your problem to start with. You got to fix that. Then you can start looking at your funnel rinse water. Um, I circled the chlorides because obviously, you know, your final rinse, what's left on the surface of those instruments is 2.7 milligrams per liter of chloride. And that's the biggest contributor to corrosion, uh, specifically pitting. Um, a chloride will eat right through a passivation layer like it's starving to death and hasn't eaten in a week. Um, then you have other uh, factors that are in there. Um, iron will mimic a chloride, but it's a longer process. So if the instruments, if you have high irons and you leave your instruments in storage for several months, by the time you it, eat, open it to use it, you may find that you have um, actual pitting. Um, so it's a slow burn process, but you know, just going through these labs, understanding where staining corrosion, the pH, th this, I know it's you know, a lot to probably, you're drinking water from a fire hose right now. Um, it's a lot to look at, it's a lot to delve into, and nine times out of 10, you get water tests, they send them back to you and you look at it and go, I don't know. I see a bunch of numbers, but I don't know what the influence factors are and how they interact with one another and how do I fix it? Um, so that's, that's a lot of the science that I spend my time trying to help um, health systems get back on track with situations where they have, spending a lot of money on instrumentation, refurbishment, repair, and uh, replacement for that matter. Um, and then you can get into kind of the steam numbers where, you know, these benchmarks that I utilize are established um, for industrialized nations. We in the U.S. do not use these numbers currently, and I know the ST-108 should be out soon. I haven't seen the details of it, but hopefully it will probably mimic um, the uh, EN-285, which is a, ENC, it's a ISO, um, you know, interactive document. So hopefully we'll have some of these standards here in the near future where we can look at that. Um, again, industrialized nations, with the exception of the U.S., do not use tap water. Everything is regulated through the process, measured and blended if needed um, to hit certain specs. Um, I guess, and the, the last little bit here is just that, you know, can you consider looking at other nations and what they do? And I'm part of a global team. There's 27 of me in the world that do this. I cover the U.S. market. So when we look at this stuff and we all collaborate, they kind of laugh at us looking at like, I can't believe you guys just use tap water from whatever source it is. No one checks it or measures it. And well, that's the way it is. But they, they view in medical instrumentation as, as we currently view pharmaceutical injections. Um, you know, why would you use something you don't have control of the process when it's an instrument that's going into a, an eye, a spine, a brain, some, you know, delicate tissues, even, you know, in some cases you have detergent carryovers, so you're doing an anastomosis on a, a coronary vessel. Well, yeah, you could definitely have necrosis of a tissue if you're not paying attention to this stuff. And, you know, it, it, we do seem to be a little bit of the wild, wild west, but I'll let go of my soapbox for now. I know we're trying to do better with it. Um, and have better standards, but this is something that tap water will fluctuate. It will change in your, you know, is your purified system able to handle it? And when it does, how are you using it in your process? Is it going to transfer, transfer over and you're, are you going to have carryover? And then you add that to whatever your steam quality issues are. Um, so a lot of people moving into clean steam, which eliminates be really having to do much testing here, just other than making sure it's uh, what you think it is. So enough on water analysis, because I can drone on for hours about that. Um, Cross-contamination and other basic concepts, as I was telling you, you know, you have corrosion in your equipment or on your machines and vice versa. They all contribute to, you know, to, you know risk to your investment. Um, it's it's kind of like the flu. You know, if you, you put corroded instruments into a machine, the machine corrodes. You put a corroded you know, or you put instruments in a credit machine, your instrument's going to credit. So just understand, I'm thinking everyone's probably pretty well known that that's a fact and a process that you have to always be aware about. So let's talk a little bit about water systems. I'll go over this really, you know, kind of, I'm not going to get too in deep with it because I don't know how much it will help you, but hopefully just understanding a high level. What is soft water? Um, it's basically, you're just removing calcium and magnesium from the water. Uh, the main reason people soften water is if you have a lot of scale on your sinks and you want to eliminate the, you know, the chalky looking, you know, gray, white, shady stuff, 
Um, it may build up on the inside of your machinery. It can scale up inside your heat exchangers and then your heaters don't work properly. But I would say by and large, the, large, the, the most common reason people want soft water is because it's what's required for you to feed your RO system. So if you're on RO system, I can pretty much guarantee that you probably have a softened water feeding it because calcium will clog up those membranes very quickly. And if you have hard water, um, you're gonna be replacing a very expensive part very frequently. So if you're not aware of that, I would talk to your water people and say, hey, we need to make sure we have a softener in here so we stop spending so much money on RO membranes. Um, but again, you exchanging calcium and magnesium for, for salt, basically. And that's the, if you see the diagram there at the salt bed. Uh, it's very simple, nothing complicated there. Um, RO systems, SD stuff from the bottom left picture there, like these massive um, membranes all the way down to, you know, the little local ones that you see there in the picture on the right, um, which I'm guessing most of you probably that use RO water see that. You have the, you know, two to four little membranes and a holding tank that gets recirculated and when the washer demands it, it gets bumped over. Um, so, you know, I don't know that there's a whole lot of value, but you're always welcome to reach out to me if you want to talk about cost and effect and that kind of stuff in terms of what systems to go through. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of, you know, high investment costs initially, but you also have a long-term solution um, for water and you can hold it, store it, that type of thing. Um, then on the other side, we have DI. So deionized water, same kind of concept. It's uh, resin beds that have little beads in there and they filter your water and it can achieve very good high quality um, water for you. Uh, low investment because there's basically your exchange tanks, you buy, get a contract and they come change them out for you um, every month or two weeks or you know whatever your usage is based off of. Um, but you do have situations where you have something called breakthrough. So if those uh, tanks expire and they're not rotated or exchanged properly, not only will you have uh, bad water, but anything that was retained in there up until that period, of whatever that period of time is, will just dump out in high levels. So if you have a failed tank, you can all of a sudden, boom, everything in your, your inventory turns brown. Um, and then you wonder, hey, something's wrong with our water. Well, no, it's just something wrong with the tank. You let it expire and then it dumped high levels. It's, you know, you would have had lower levels if you just used tap water. Um, so be aware, those are things that can contribute significantly to your process in, uh, when it comes to staining and corrosion. Uh, a typical RO system that you see out there, again, um, but this one is a combined system. Personally, I think this is the best of all worlds. You have RO system, a holding tank, you're recirculating it with a UV light to kill any bacteria, you're measuring your endotoxins, and then on demand, the water gets polished through DI tanks, um, so essentially, you're getting very, very, very high quality purified water. You need usually zero or one, maybe two micro siemens uh, is common when I see systems like this. And that's the best of all worlds. And more importantly, if you have a pump go down for your RF system, you can just switch to a bypass and just use your DI tanks and vice versa. If you have, somehow you have a back order of DI or they don't show up, you can cut it off and just use RO. Either way, each, each system has its own advantages and disadvantages, but the combination of both um, covers you for even, you know, like the bypass issue. So you're always covered. Um, and I like systems like that. So kind of quick overview. This is pretty much what you see in the United States here where you have city water going to the sinks, um, to the washers. And then for the final rinse, we decide we're gonna sprinkle clean water on it at that point. Um, and then city water goes to the treatment, to the boilers, and we have what's called black steam. Um, so it's just very industrial steam that goes through iron pipes. Typically not filtered too much, so you get what you get, and hopefully you don't have uh, any carryover from the uh, chemical treatments that end up staining your instruments and or your chambers or your equipment. So this is a very common um, scenario here. <clears throat> um, another process that I've seen more people get into, and certainly I encourage those who have the technology and ability to do it, is taking your RO system you know, obviously you needed the sinks for manual cleaning, but also to utilize them for your, you use tap water for your mechanical, for your just standard wash, you know, enzyme, da da da. And then you get to your intermediate rinse and you use your purified water at that point to cut all that carryover off. Um, 
only challenge is most people will turn to their capacity. It was spec'd out for us only to do it on final rents. You don't have enough to produce to be able to switch it. So that would be something you would have to look at. But I have seen incredible turnarounds on inventories for those who took the RODI, put it in the intermediate rinse. So you're, you're rinsing with purified water. And then when you bring the purified water in for the thermal, um, your, your numbers are down below all the um, thresholds for corrosion. Um, so that's a really, really, really important concept to understand how your washers work there and what you can do and if you have the technology to do it and the capacity because uh, you will use more purified water. And then, of course, um, you have those who have basically RO to everything, um, including a clean steam generator. So steam is generated from purified water injected into the chamber, and um, you don't have the risk of impurities unless, of course, your RO water feeding the steam is contaminated. Um, otherwise, that's the best of all worlds. And I, you know, a few people I've evaluated with a system like this, their instruments still look like they're new. Um, so it's achievable, it's doable. Uh, it's a matter of will, um, if you can convince your system to do it. And then, uh, you know, a lot of uh, industrialized nations outside the US pretty much use purified water for most everything they do, including steam. So, you know, I guess one real quick thing. I, I do have a dream someday that this will be the US system where we control everything we do and then I won't have a job because everyone will have purified water and everything and I'll retire. Um, all right, so let's take a look at some loggers here and I'm kind of getting tight on time. Um, this is a, you know, a tool that I use when I do evaluations. It's a, a probe that's programmed by the computer. I throw it into an autoclave or a washer or whatever. Um, equipment I'm testing and I look at the, uh, basically the influences of water, the chemistry. So if you look at the pre-wash, you can see that's just the tap water and the, the connectivities or, you know, the pink line is your connectivity number. So we're in, uh, I don't know, two mid 200s for their tap water and then they bring they drain it and you have the enzyme come in here um, and there's no rinse. They don't drain the enzyme. They go straight into the detergent cycle. They raise the temperature, which is your red line. So I look at all these influencing factors so I understand what's happening during the wash. You can see the connectivity went up. The chemistry had a strong effect. Temperature's getting hotter. Are they being too aggressive, not aggressive enough? Um, is there material compatibility issues with what they're doing and trying to understand that? And then you get into this rinse. Here we're back to around the same level as the pre-wash with the tap water. <clears throat> and then we drain it and we bring in purified water, or we think we're putting in purified water. And lo and behold, the connectivity level of that purified water, which should be zero or one at the bottom of this chart, is way up in the 400s. Um, so that's why I called this slide rut row hospital, because they obviously have a catastrophic failure or they don't have RO water or DI, anything. There's no purified water and whatever water they're using is dirtier than the tap water. So that's one of those situations where, you know, I don't have hair to scratch, but I scratch my head and go, hmm, something's very awfully wrong here. So what do we, what did we want this to look like? Well, here's pretty much keeping up with the Jones's hospital. And most thing, mostly what I see here in the U.S. here, you have two pre-rinses, then you have some enzyme, then you have your detergent, then you have a city water rinse that's worse than the regular city water. So I guess there's things being carried over. Uh, likely to have chemicals in it because it's not measuring the same as the city. Um, and then your rinse, when you come into the thermal, you get start getting really hot. Um, and then the connectivity is up around 80. Like, well, why is that? You know, for producing water that's supposed to be less than 15 microsiemens, why is it at 80? Well, clearly you're having carryover here from the detergent cycle and then it's carrying over again into your final rinse. So your instruments, still have the opportunity for staining and corrosion that will be on the surface because we can see it here and i will also take tests or lab work from the um from that rinse to you know show the connectivity you know through an actual lab test and then what are the impurities is this where your contributing factor to having corrosion on your instruments is lying um and then of course here this is abel university my ideal world where everything's perfect um <clears throat> we have the if you can see here, the rinse and critical water. Remember, if you remember from the plast 
two slides, um, that bar has been way up here. And now all of a sudden, you know, the concept of using your purified water for intermediate rinse, when you get down to the very bottom, look, you can't even see the pink line because it's uh, pretty close to zero, which means you don't have any contamination that could be left on the instruments through your wash cycle. So again, because you have the greatest water in the world, how you use it and the influencing factors around it and the impingement, all those processes um, still can contribute. You can have a brand new washer and um, perfect water. It doesn't mean you won't have corrosion because you've got to understand these factors. <clears throat> Um, and this is one of my biggest tools, at least when it comes to uh, washer analysis, to understand where you are. Just depending on where you are in the country and different influencing factors, you know, you may need two rinses. You may really just, you may have no other choice but to increase your capacity and use water or blend it, as a lot of the new modern machines, you know, allow you to do. So hopefully you're bored to death with all the loggers. Um, Let's talk about a uh, real quick here because I'm almost out of time and I would love to have a couple questions that uh, you may have to kind of talk about. Um, but understanding SPD processes and in a relationship to corrosion. Again, looking back at the washers, understanding everything from the end of use in the operating room, what chemicals your uh, instruments are exposed to, whether it's blood, saline, uh, pharmaceuticals, Understanding the interoperative procedures is also, you know, a good important thing. Why, why does LND, why does every hospital at LND have corrosion? Because they use a lot of saline to irrigate. They don't switch to water. It doesn't mean you can't rinse with water at the end of the process, but um, interoperatively. Uh, pacemaker trace, another one, because they always irrigate the, um, you know, pacemaker pocket with best tracing mixed with um, saline. So it's typical to see the scissors and needle holders for pacemaker trays all corrode with, uh, you know, the weld seams all turn red and orange because they're corroding. Um, so understanding that interoperative process is important. Uh, what's being used on the back table? What the OR's policies and procedures? Are they enforcing that things should be wiped off so you don't have organic staining if instruments are allowed to sit from, you know, an entire day for long procedures and then they sit overnight or they get left in the hallway? Uh, there's a lot of reasons, but understanding that kind of those influences all, you know, it's easy to blame SPD. Um, but there's a lot of factors that are outside of SPD. How long does it take to transport? Is it SPD's responsibility? Are they using pre-sprays too much, too little? Um, not enough Do they coat the top and uncover it and hope that the rest of the instruments somehow in that pile get pre-spray on it. Um, all those things are factors that have to be looked at. Um, decontamination, you know, a lot of times trays get brought down there and they sit for hours after they've already been sitting for hours upstairs. Um, you know, and then they're sitting in a big soupy mess of, you know, pharmaceuticals, blood, saline, and then you mix pre-spray in there. And it's just, you know, you have this a new chemical equation and scientific thing that you're working on. Um, it's kind of cool for me. <laughs> um, so what's happening at the sink side? You know, what chemicals you're using? What's the quality of the water? How's it interact? You know, a lot of people look at their chemicals and they trust, hey, I put it in the city water, but everyone's city water is so different. What are the upper and level lower limits of how much, you know, um, you know, contamination can be in a, in a municipal supply and does it, in, you know, render the uh, chemicals ineffective? I mean, there's a lot of things that people don't really kind of take the time to look, but these are all influencing factors. Um, Wash and disinfector, and we just went over the loggers at nauseum here, so I don't need to belabor that anymore. But understand how your washers work. Uh, retain moisture is another thing. That if your dry cycle is not working right, and you leave it kind of wet, sitting in the finger mat for you know half a day or day or a week in some places, um, you know it's going to sit there and corrode. And you have that carryover sitting out in the air, wet. You're going to have corrosion. Um, things you know, processed in a closed position or sterilized the, the two inch stringer with an eight inch instrument. You wonder why all the box locks turn brown. Um, not a wonder to me, it's just a process issue that you have uh, and they have to be looked at. Um, so sterilization, obviously impurities in the steam has a major effect because it's the last thing that touches the instruments. And if you've ever seen the inside of what it looks like on the video for a steam sterilizer, uh, you get about 10 mLs, 10 cc's of uh, water that kind of boils on the bottom of the tray for every 
pound of uh, steel you have in there. So you can imagine if you saw a video of it, you just, you know, there's all this water bubbling and lavaging the instruments and then goes into the dry stage. And then all of a sudden, all those impurities on the instruments end up on your tray liner and you're blaming the steam. Well, it could be carryover from the washer, it could be your steam. Um, if you put weight tray liners on your autoclave rack and sterilize them and they come out white, probably not your steam. Um, but if they come out brown, well, is it a contributing factor or is it the factor? Um, that's one of those things where you have to kind of really boil down and it helps to have uh, the right testing and, and thought process in place. Um, so again, this is another process related in issue. And I know probably most of you know this, it's just, you know, how pre-sprays are used. And if, I mean, if you have a pile of instruments and you spray the top of this, that's, you know, kind of like pouring oil on the roof of your car and hoping that, you know, the engine gets lubricated. Um, you know, same concept when you use lubricants. When you put it in the wash and you're lubricating in the washer, all right, well, we lube the basket and all the retractors, the malleables are nice and greasy. You know, it's a great concept, I guess, for whoever buys into that. But I prefer putting lubrication into the hinges um, where it needs it and not all over everything. Uh, and then people mix lows with containers and the containers get, uh, you know, lubricated. Just It's a kind of a weird concept to me, but I, a lot of people like it. Um, so, you know, what this poses a lot of hazards to the technician. So it, obviously it's a cleaning challenge. I mean, how are you going to clean everything in there? I do utilize, um, especially design little uh, box lock, detachable box locks that you can put, you know, fake blood, kind of like the toasty test type stuff in there and you put them together and you put them in the basket at the bottom and then you wash it and then you open it up and you see that it didn't get cleaned inside there. There's no way for the, the machine isn't designed for you to put a pile of instruments in. So you're going to have things get caught up in crevices and it creates like a sieve and you get impurities, steam dries it and boom. And that's not a fault of the water or anything else. It's a fault of your process um, and understanding that this is completely unacceptable way to process your instruments. And probably a few out there going, oh, my God, that's what we do every day. Now we, now we understand this is a huge influencer on here. Um, you can have detergents and other type of stuff to get you know, left in those crevices because they're not getting exposed to the rinse water and properly flushed out. Um, so if you have a lot of instruments that have the box locks turning brown or, you know, discolored or corroding, uh, it may be a process related issue nothing else to do with your water or your chemistry. So keep that in mind. And again, every part of your process, you have to understand that whether it's an OR or in decon or an inspection or sterilization for that matter. You keep things closed, you have a tendency for impurities to get caught in there and they're going to stain and corrode. Uh, it just depends on what the elements are that get caught up in there. Um, so, you know, if drying can't really be effective when you have a pile of instruments, um, you know, just the simple, I mean, I'm sure everyone knows an example and you're, you know, you load your dishwasher up, you can pile everything on everything and it comes out and it's not dry and you get mad at the machine. Well, it's how you're loading it, you know, that the, the machine's not designed that way. So just keep that in mind. It's a huge factor that I run into quite a bit. Um, so stuff's overloaded. It's a pain to have to separate it when it comes to you in a pile and it's a safety issue. And then you have two trays, you're doubling the footprint, you know, good opportunity here to take it to the OR and say, hey, what are this tray you're not using and get it removed so that we can better and more effectively process this stuff for you. Um, and buying bigger trays doesn't necessarily help. Um, washer efficacy, uh, we're almost at the end here, so I'll stop talking. Um, washer checks, you know, propulsion caps, broken caps, clogs, browns, all these things have a huge effect. Um, I see uh, manifolds, the, the, the washer racks, if you're not familiar with manifold terminology, it's the rack you put in the washer. Um, those things can get warped and bent over time. They don't properly seal. You lose your impingement and all your efficacy is out the door. Um, again, chemicals can have an influence on the efficacy and missing parts and clogged spray arms. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've seen a clogged spray arm in my, you know, TOSI test or whatever test I'm using for efficacy testing. When I do these analysis, um, they uh, fail. And just that one rack will fail. It's like, well, spray arms clogged. So it's amazing how vital it is to make sure that stuff is working properly. Um, so that being said, um, there are definitely a lot of other tests and a lot more crazy chemistry with organics and inorganics and swabs and endotoxins, bacteria, all the stuff we could get into and talk about those influences. But um, I will conclude my presentation at this point. 
and I think we still have at least 42 seconds or so for questions. Yeah, we've, we've actually got a few minutes. So. <laughs> I know, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was, that was really great, Christian. I think, um, you know, you're talking to the right person because I am a fellow nerd when it comes to the water and chemistry side. So I love to hear about this type of thing and, and some of the troubleshooting that you mentioned. And you really did hit home on one thing that I often saw and emphasize when I would visit departments is process, process, process. You know, I think, you know, you could even uh, reiterate a little bit more, or talk a little bit more about it, but it's not always just one thing, right? It's because I've seen wash, you know, they say, departments have said, we've got great water and we paid for these huge, beautiful filtration systems and our instruments aren't getting clean and we're having corrosion issues and you know, I, I even saw some where the machines themselves, like you mentioned, were not calibrated correctly to dose the right detergents. So there are those various processes that we need to pay attention to. Absolutely. Um, so I was going to ask you, I think in terms of I th there's the science involved in all of this, which can be a little bit intimidating, right? And there is as we just alluded to all the processes, but are, do you have any examples of some quick, maybe not quick, some troubleshooting uh, processes that departments can implement when they start seeing corrosion issues? You know, you could probably even refer back to your influencer chart. <laughs> um, you know, that's one of those type things that if it all of a sudden started, you know, why? Um, certainly digging into an investigation is something that takes a little bit of time, but understanding your processes and what have changed. I mean, steam is a good example. Uh, this is the time of year where they, you know, they switch steam systems and they go to the bigger boilers and then you have kind of the little startup and uh, pressure changes, maybe some impurities in the line or whatever. And all of a sudden you have this flash of bad stuff and then you go to test it and everything's fine. You know, two weeks later, I show up and everything's good. Um, you know, it's it's certainly something that you just need to keep an eye on if you've had rapid changes. If you just, if you, you know, the, the worst thing that I've noticed about even like silicates, even silicate staining doesn't necessarily have a known harm um, to an instrument. It just is unsightly and it gives the impression that you have a dirty process, but um, it's just... I've thought, I'm sorry, I forgot where I was going with that with the silicates, but um, I, I don't, I'll leave it at that. I, I'm, I'm hoping I can. <laughs> yeah, no, I, just, I thought I'd ask that because I think I don't think there's any quick solution, but having you know some sort of process to where you can maybe maybe look or troubleshoot at the you know from front to back or back to front. Um, you know, those are things that maybe I, was... I mean, the bottom line, the, the basic is, you know, hey, what's your tap water doing? What are you using? How are you using it? And then testing your, your purified water. You, there isn't an easy way for anyone to really get final rinse water. That's something I specialize in and have different techniques for different types of washers. But um, you can, in some health systems, after they, you know, look at some of the loggers that I use, they purchase them. Unfortunately, they're extremely expensive. Uh, you're talking about anywhere from four to ten thousand dollars per system. So it's not something you can just oh cool I'm going to go order that and test it out. Um, you also have to be well versed and trained in that type of equipment. Um, and then once you have the results, what do you do with them if you don't know how to read it? Um, right. That that's kind of I guess more of the beauty of having people that are experts in the industry and come in and take a snapshot. Like I said, I have a lot of tools in my toolbox and a lot of you know. Uh, you know, cool toys, as I call them, um, to play with. And every every evaluation you go into, you start, you know, with your basic evaluation and you go through the basic protocol and process, but every step there's like, a, oh, but I have noticed this and so now I need to test for that. Um, so just, I mean, the one-on-ones basically make sure your stuff's calibrated, make sure you get some water tests. If you're not sure, because everyone's going to tell you everything looks good, 
um, just had a recent account where they said, hey, this company said this is good. This company said that's good. This consultant said everything else is good. And then I came in after they chased this problem around for, you know, a month. Two hours later, I'm like, well, your bypass is open. You're flooding water into your your um, RO tank. It's like, yeah, the water coming out of the membranes is good and the washer's working properly, but the water you're putting into the washer is the problem. And no one had a way to measure it. Um, so, you know, like I said, uh, oftentimes steam is a tricky one too because um, it's measured for industrial usage at the plant. And yeah, you can get your pH and some of your numbers and they look at TDS, which is total dissolvable solids and other numbers, but they're not looking at the corrosion influencers at the end user, which is SPD. Um, and trying to get a sample from the chamber is a tricky thing. We have a special device that we designed that allows us to do that to get sample to get to the lab. Um, but, you know, most major companies also have, you know, they, um, you know, a, a cooler that you can put on the back of the sterilizer and take your own samples, but most people ought not to have it. Um, so it's kind of hard for you to be able to do that without calling an expert in to test that stuff for you. Right. Yeah. And I think this kind of alludes to what we've been talking about all day, as far as having a reputable, repair partner on the vendor side and you know this would coincide with using an expert to offload some of that burden on the spd staff because obviously there's a lot going on we've got you know the first the first priority is patient care and to to have these partners and to have quarterly maybe even monthly reviews uh on this and just to make sure that everything is working smoothly it's probably yeah, and I do have a, a a lot of customers that I do that for. I have quarterly contracts. I go out and you know just do the same process and the benchmark over a year's time to see you know. And, and believe it or not, there's been times I walked in and I'm um, said, so, "Well, you didn't know you had a problem, but you got a problem. You know, it's, something's changed. Um, right. And here's what you need to do to correct it. Uh, and you know, you, a lot of times you just don't know. I mean, time goes by six months later, and everyone's like, "Well, we're used to it. So instruments always look like that." Um, and then you get enough stains and corrosion and other stuff that you, you get a fatigue factor from the uh, technician side and they end up, you know, getting used to seeing things. Then you start missing the bio burdens and the things that really are truly um, detrimental to the patient care. Because uh, right. you get used to seeing the stuff. You have red stains. Is it rust or is it blood? I don't know. Whatever. It's always like that. And uh, right. I've seen it many times. Um, if you have a clean instrument and they're looking at a very smooth surface, it's much easier to identify, ooh, we got an issue there. Yep. Um, you know, it's kind of like finding Waldo, you know, it gets camouflaged with enough stains. You start missing the big stuff. Right. Um, I do have one question here. I know we're over time, yep. but I'm going to try real quick. Um, so I'm ask the, um, outpatient mostly, how was water sampling test obtained from RO washer final rinse? Well, you can't, um, I have, a, like I said, special ways of doing it in different washers, um, special devices that will allow me to collect water at that point in the cycle. Um, so it's really, really tough for you to do. Uh, there are validation ports and things that you can run tubes and take samples and withdraw with a, you know, a pump or a machine during that part of the cycle. Um, the other thing is a lot of people, even just testing the RO can be a challenge because they didn't put a testing port in there. So you, um, you know, end up having to go to a gooseneck sink or something and, and use just to even test your purified water. But if you don't have a sample port on your purified system, you should talk to your water company and say, Hey, I want to be able to test what's being produced coming into my department at any given time. So at least you have control of that. Right. That's awesome. Um, well, why don't we throw in one more for you since we've got a couple of minutes. I know we're over, but this is a worthwhile discussion. Uh, this comes from Justice. Uh, thoughts on white specs on instruments, both steam and hydrogen peroxide, I guess with the use of both. Um, say the first part of that question again, because I didn't realize it was going to peroxide. Yeah, so it's, I guess, thoughts on the white specs that you see on instruments uh, through steam and the use of hydrogen peroxide. I think that's how I'm, I'm gathering that question. Um, 
All right. Well, you know, there's, like I said, everyone seems to create a different kind of science experiment. And it's kind of hard to give a blanket statement of or something like that, because without knowing what the white specks are, you're kind of guessing. Um, that's something where I would test it and have the, you know, try to understand the molecular breakdown of what it is to be able to tell you where it's coming from. I will say more often than not, um, you're, it's either scale from hard water, but especially in peroxide, um, I have some of my testing, some of the things I have seen is enzymes that aren't properly removed and efficiently removed from, you know, hand wash process. Um, they have a tendency to create precipitate and those little white flakes that you get. And I see that more in peroxide than, than in steam sterilization. Um, but I would also look to make sure that you're probably really effectively rinsing everything with purified water as you should be doing for the IFU. Um, I do still run into customers that don't have purified water rinses for manual processes. Um, and that's usually the first thing I give them, like you can't meet the IFU, so therefore you're not meeting the standards of care because um, you're rinsing with tap water and that tap water will react depending on what's in it. Um, and like I said, tap water is unregulated. You get dirt, sand, metal flakes, um, all kinds of contamination that come through there and it can react with that peroxide in that chamber if it's left on there. So it's vital and important that you're rinsing with purified water. And if, you know, not just rinsing it, but effectively rinsing it. Um, Great. All right. Well, awesome, awesome presentation. Thanks again, Christian. And I'd like to get to a couple other questions, but we are running long and um, probably could do a whole nother hour on a lot of this. So really yeah, appreciate, absolutely. really appreciate everything. Um, you know, I think if anybody wants to reach out to Christian directly, his contact information on your side is on the right hand side of the screen. So feel free to reach out to him directly. We do have some questions that I will filter over to him uh, at the end of this conference so he can reach out to you as well. So uh, Christian, great presentation once again. Thanks for joining us. It's been a day and we've got one more coming at you, everybody. So please stick with us and we'll see you in about 10 minutes. All right, thanks. All right, thank you. Appreciate it. Have a great weekend.